Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Robert Menendez and President of the Council of Americas, Susan Siegel. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope everyone uh, enjoyed their networking session and are well organized for the second half of our afternoon's program. I have the great pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Senator Robert Menendez of New Jersey. Senator Menendez is a longtime friend of the Council. In 2011, we presented him with our Chairman's Award for Leadership in the Americas, along with his Senate companion, Richard Lugar. The award was testament to his stalwart presence in the Senate, career in government, championing democratic values in the Western Hemisphere and throughout the world. As a New Yorker myself, Bob is exactly what you expect from someone in the New York area, the Big Apple tri-state area to be precise. He's tough, he's gritty, he's a fighter, and he knows exactly what needs to happen. He has fought tirelessly for economic justice around the world, from his home state of New Jersey to Africa to Central America. His advocacy draws his roots as a son of Cuban immigrants growing up in a tenement building in Union City, New Jersey. He rose from, from that to become the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee during the 113th Congress, one of the most revered committees in the US Congress. He has stood by democracy uh, activists pushing for reforms from Cuba to China to Russia, and now, of course, to Venezuela. And notably, he has defended US national security interests through tough legislation against regimes that undermine democracy. All this makes him a fitting leader to address the critically important topic of the state of democracy in the Western Hemisphere. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming United States Senator from New Jersey, Robert Menendez. Bueno, gracias, Susan. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Un placer darle la bienvenida aquí a el Departamento de Estado y estar con el Concilio de las Américas en este encuentro hemisférico. And for those of you who are terrorized, I might continue for a few moments in Spanish. Let me uh, let me say I'm I'm thrilled to be here again. I want to thank Susan for her leadership and Eric as well on behalf of the Councils uh, of the Americas uh, for the invitation to have me here. Uh, and Susan, uh, as a New Jerseyite, I can tell you we appreciate New York being a great suburb of New Jersey. So uh, it, it's an honor. <laughs> you have to get the great skyline views from my side of the river. So uh, it's an honor to address the 48th Annual Washington Conference of the Americas. And having this prestigious forum at the State Department, uh, I think, underscores how government and the private sector uh, should work in concert to promote rules-based growth to build shared security and prosperity throughout the region. A lot has changed since the first conference on the Americas nearly a half century ago. Fidel Castro was only 10 years into his five-decade oppressive rule of Cuba. Colombia was overrun by armed conflict and drug cartels. And by the mid-1970s, most of the region's population lived under various repressive military dictatorships. Indeed, much has changed. In 2001, 33 countries in the region adopted the Inter-American Democratic Charter, affirming that, quote, democracy is essential for the social, political, and economic development of the peoples of the Americas. By the end of this year, 2018, 350 million voters across Latin America and the Caribbean will cast votes and elect new leaders. In February, Ecuadorians voted to reinstate presidential term limits and prevent populist leader Rafael Correra from running again. And Cuba's authoritarian regime is becoming more and more of an outlier. Yet there's no denying we still face some grave challenges. At the end of 2016, 10% of the region's population was in extreme poverty, living in destitution and desperation. Think about that. In 2016, 61 million people throughout Latin America and the Caribbean were still living on less, on less than $2 a day. 
The good news is that the growing embrace of democratic values, human rights, and the international rules-based order across the region have strengthened our collective opportunity to overcome these challenges. Our greatest challenge now is ensuring that democracy continues to deliver on its promise of a better tomorrow for everyone, that leaders and citizens uphold and reinforce laws enshrining the values and principles we all know create opportunity for all. So today I'd like to discuss how the United States is living up to the task of supporting strong rule of law and good governance efforts, the bedrocks of thriving, resilient democracies, undergirding broad-based economic growth, sustainable prosperity, and shared security for all. And I'll speak to both our successes and failures, the Trump administration's approach, the role of Congress in promoting America's foreign policy interests and conducting oversight of the executive branch. The rule of law in Latin America matters first and foremost because it ensures elected governments are accountable to its citizens. Yet beyond ensuring transparency, promoting trust, securing fundamental human rights, good democratic governance fosters economic growth by encouraging a positive business climate, one that respects property rights, enforces contracts, curbs government malfeasance, prevents corruption, and promotes citizen security. Simply put, good governance is good for business. And we have a moral and political imperative to support the rule of law, as well as an economic one. Despite new actors, including China, we, the United States, still continue to trade twice as much with the Americas than we do with China. And we export more to the region than we do to all of Asia combined. In 2017, our two-way tra trade in the Western Hemisphere totaled $1.4 trillion. More than two of every $5 in America's exports flows from this region, supporting nearly 4 million jobs across the United States. And my state of New Jersey alone exported $5 billion to the region last year, supporting tens of thousands of jobs. Investing in Latin America, in my mind, means investing in the United States. Our investments abroad will help us continue to create jobs and opportunities for American workers and businesses. But there is much more work to do. Today, our region is becoming a model for international rules-based growth. Take Argentina. Despite the recent news about the Argentine peso following President uh, Mauricio Macri's election, Argentina has experienced an incredible comeback. President Macri introduced much-needed reforms, removed the Kirscher's uh, short-sighted protective tariffs and economic distortions, and resolved Argentina's outstanding international debts in just a few short years. Private investment grew by 16% in 2017 and growth is projected to reach 2.5%, well above the regional average. In November, Argentina will host a pre prestigious G20 summit, the first time that it will be held in South America. These are the results and benefits of good democratic governance. As this progress takes root across the hemisphere, we no longer talk about regional leaders, rather countries assuming leadership roles on a global stage. Recognizing these successes, in 2016, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, created a Latin American and Caribbean regional program to strengthen its cooperation with the region. Countries from Peru to Brazil to Argentina will have the opportunity to shine as global economic leaders. The OECD can be used as a tool to encourage democratic governance, transparency, and inclusivity. Colombia, for example, is working with support from the United States and international institutions to carry out reforms in an effort to secure membership in the OECD's elite club. As President Santos put it, it's not easy to decide which is more true. Latin America needs the OECD or the OECD needs Latin America. As we champion these successes, we must be clear-eyed, however, about the consequences of weak governance systems. It's no coincidence that the countries of the northern triangle of Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, not only suffer from the weak rule of law, but also from sky-high homicide rates, poverty, drug trafficking, and migration. 
challenges that wreak havoc on their citizens with effects that spill over throughout the region. In the face of these challenges, which directly impact our own stability and prosperity, the United States cannot waver in our engagement with Central America. We must continue to work with these countries to strengthen democratic governance and the rule of law, both bilaterally and through international institutions. That includes support for the invaluable work of the Organization of American States' mission to support the fight against corruption and impunity in Honduras and the United Nations International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, an institution that supported efforts to hold four of Guatemala's fast, last five presidents accountable for their actions. As Americans, we must cry out against the erosion of the rule of law, regardless of which party is in power. Whether it takes place in Nicaragua or Honduras, we must be outraged by reports of police killing peaceful protesters demanding accountability from their government. And finally, we must hold leaders accountable to their own commitments to our region's shared democratic values and the rule of law, regardless of political ideology. I believe we must support our allies and closest partners as they grow into global stewards of peace, stability, security, and prosperity. We must continue to be a bulwark against the deterioration of democratic governance. So I'm deeply disturbed by the Trump administration's rejections of these values and the erosion of our leadership from the administration's toxic combination of disengagement and threat-based tactics. In 2017, U.S. approval ratings plummeted in every country in our hemisphere, placing us behind China. This loss of respect will make it more difficult to advance our objectives by raising the political cost of cooperating with the United States. Last month, the President became the first United States President not to attend the Summit of the Americas. Last year, the former Secretary of State missed not one, but two critical meetings of foreign ministers coming together to address the crisis in Venezuela. One of those meetings was only five blocks away at the headquarters of the OAS. These two examples illustrate to me a broader trend of U.S. disengagement in the region. Fifteen months into the Trump presidency, we remain without a top official for Latin America at USAID and without ambassadors to Mexico, Panama, Honduras, Jamaica, and the Trump administration waited until March of this year to even nominate an assistant secretary for the Western Hemisphere. How can we lead without top diplomats at the helm? Or when the President's fiscal year 2019 budget request proposes a staggering 42 percent cut for Latin America, which would decimate the diplomatic and development tools we desperately need to promote stability, prosperity, and security throughout the hemisphere? How can we expand essential international partnerships to address the epidemic of heroin and fentanyl if we cut funding for counter-narcotics cooperation with Mexico by 38 percent? How can we support Colombia's efforts to consolidate the gains of peace or address the rise in coca cultivation when we cut our budget there by 33 percent? Sadly, these are just a few examples of how the President and his former top diplomat systematically gutted and demoralized the agency primarily responsible for promoting American power and American values. Unfortunately, when the administration has engaged, it has usually been, in my view, to our de detriment. Is there anyone in this room who thinks it advanced United States interests when the President was caught on tape boasting and laughing about lying to the Prime Minister of Canada? When the President repeatedly insults Mexican citizens or demands that their government pay for a border wall that is an insult to the very essence of Mexico as our second largest export partner uh, market in the entire globe, second largest export market for goods and services of the United States in the entire globe. When the President's administration conducted an overtly political process to end the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals DACA program and the temporary protective status designations for Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Haiti, and just last week, Honduras. Reckless decisions which threaten to destabilize the region 
and negatively affect U.S. national security by forcibly repatriating hundreds of thousands of people to fragile countries overwhelmed by high rates of violence and poverty. And if the United States does not actively encourage and promote our own values and interests, negative forces both within the region and from the outside will happily fill the void. China, not the United States, is now the biggest trading partner for several of the major economies in the region, Brazil, Chile, Peru. China's transactional approach offers short-term economic benefits in order to extract political gains from countries that often do not reflect our national interests. We must not be silent as China announces investments in Panama and the Dominican Republic in exchange for ending diplomatic links with Taiwan. China's often opportunistic tactics make no efforts to ensure that workers will be protected or that all citizens will have an opportunity to benefit from economic growth. The United States, on the other hand, must continue sustained, positive engagement and a rules-based approach to promote long-term growth that can benefit all citizens. And at the far end of the failure of transparent and rules-based governance is the tragedy unfolding in Venezuela. We are weeks away from a sham presidential election. Nicolás Maduro and the criminals in his cabinet have used repressive policies and economic mismanagement to drive Venezuela, one of the most prosperous and promising economies in the hemisphere, to a political social catastrophe. The suffering and despair of the people of Venezuela cries out for moral leadership and a threat to the stability of the entire region, not a policy of America first. While I support the administration's use of targeted sanctions and Deputy Secretary Sullivan's recent announcement of new aid, despite years of a humanitarian crisis, the United States has not offered, in my view, the levels of humanitarian assistance it should have. In response, I'm pleased to announce that along with a bipartisan group of senators, next week I will be introducing legislation that represents a much needed comprehensive approach. Our bill will expand the U.S. response to Venezuela's humanitarian and refugee crisis. It will codify sanctions on those individuals involved in undermining democratic governance and further accelerate kingpin sanctions against officials involved in the drug trade. It will require the administration to work with our partners in Latin America to develop their own targeted sanctions tools. It will include congressional support for efforts to hold Venezuelan officials accountable at the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity. And it will push for new tools to recover the tens of billions of dollars that Venezuelan officials have stolen from their citizens. I see a unique opportunity for bipartisan agreement on Venezuela. And I look forward to working with the executive branch to implement a strategy that deals with the suffering of the Venezuelan people. And I echo the call for the Venezuelan government to suspend its May 20 elections. As we look to the future, we must continue to work together. The year 2018 has been hailed as a year of change in the Americas because of the number of elections throughout the region. But recent decades have taught us that elections or the transfer of power alone do not make a country democratic. Democracies required a continued commitment to free and fair elections, freedom of the press, a vibrant civil society, and the protection of fundamental human rights. In order to capitalize on the advances of the past decades, we must encourage a rules-based system of growth that reduces political risk and fosters investment. Critically, we must embrace these challenges together. There is immense potential and I know that many of you are in the best positions to help shape that growth, to invest in the region and its people. From heads of state to hardworking families, we must collectively work to ensure that democracy delivers on its promises and that together we build the shared opportunity, shared growth, and shared prosperity that will continue to propose the Americas forward. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Here. You mentioned the bill um, that is going to be in front of the Senate mm. regarding Venezuela. Um, could you 
maybe talk a little bit more about that? And will the sanctions that you're talking about in the plan really extend also? Because when we just sanction indivi the individual and we don't touch the families and we don't go broader, there's really no incentive. So can you touch a little bit more on this and, and what you would expect the outcome to be? Well, Susan, I see I'm sitting by your name, so I've always wanted to be Susan oh, Siegel. So uh, uh, let me, uh, no, that's fine. I finally achieved my, my lifetime goal. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> so uh, first of all, I want to uh, emphasize that this is bipartisan. So it's Republican and Democratic senators coming together. I think that's incredibly important. We speak stronger when we speak uh, with a united voice. Secondly, that there is a significant humanitarian element here, which I think is incredibly important. Uh, and for which we have agreement on doing that. And then thirdly, as it relates to the targeted sanctions, yes, we are, we are targeting individuals, but individuals with a ripple effect. And it is our hope that uh, the nature of doing so uh, will extend beyond and be a force multiplier to other elements within that individual's target who may in fact uh, be benefiting from that individual's uh, malign uh, activities and theft uh, from the Venezuelan people, uh, as well as those who are involved in uh, narcotics trafficking and whatnot, and those who may benefit from that as well. So I think it'll be broader in nature uh, and more pervasive, while still avoiding sectoral sanctions, which I think would only hurt the people of Venezuela at this time. Are you willing to take a question from the floor? Sure, I'll take okay. a couple. So we'll take a couple questions from the floor. We're willing to take a couple questions from the floor. Maurice? It, it would not be a Washington conference without Maurice asking a question. Oh, yeah, right. I want to talk to you about NAFTA. And for many of us, we're quite concerned. We have an administration that's not sure where to go. And then we have a situation in some of the countries and possibility of an election in Mexico that may also be uh, somewhat detrimental to a solution of NAFTA. You've got senators from the uh, agricultural states, Republican, Democrat. Could you talk about a coalition, perhaps, of those Democrats and Republicans who might be able to at least weigh in more on the question of having a NAFTA bill? So uh, as a member of this, in addition to the Foreign Relations Committee, as a member of the Senate Finance Committee, we deal with all tax and trade policy. Uh, and we have had Ambassador Lighthouser before us on several occasions. And uh, look, I understand updating NAFTA to deal with the realities of uh, where we are today. The marketplace has changed. On questions of intellectual property rights and telecommunications, the world has changed from when NAFTA was originally devised. That makes sense. Uh, but I am concerned uh, that some of the administration's focus and issues undermine, for example, investor protections. I think those are critically important. Uh, and I think uh, a five-year sunset is also a problematic. Uh, I have met with business people uh, across the, our country uh, many different times, leaders of different corporations and different sectors, and when we were talking about tax reform, they always gave me two words, give me certainty and predictability, and I will figure out the way. I think that's also true about trade agreements, give me certainty and predictability so that I know under what regime, uh, rules-based regime, I'm operating under. So investor protection, how that gets pursued, if there's a sunset, how much certainty, a five-year sunset, how much certainty does that provide you in making investments that will be multi-year in many cases? Um, and on, you know, certainly as someone who comes from a state with uh, very significant inventions, we care about intellectual property rights and we believe that those can be beefed up. But uh, I think there's going to be a concern at the end of the day, uh, depending upon what the administration comes up with. And we'll have to see. Now, I know that it is their desire to come to at least an agreement in principle, if not an actual agreement, very soon. Uh, and that would happen if, and to bring it to a vote for, to Congress this year. 
To do that, they would have to have an agreement largely put together by June at the very latest in order to be able to, with all the appropriate notices and uh, process in Congress for a lame duck session. So that's a lot of work to be done in a relatively short period of time. I'm more about getting it right than rushing to an artificial deadline. I understand some of the interest that exists about having what I hope will be a good understanding uh, before uh, Mexico's elections, but I don't think that that in and of itself should be the driver as to relates to making sure we have a good deal. So there will be many interests. There will be agricultural interests, rules of origin uh, interests with the auto industry, of course intellectual property rights for some of our states that generate significant intellectual property rights. And of course there will be, uh, you know, again, what type of labor enforcement you have and what type of investor protection uh, enforcement do you have. And those are all critical elements. And uh, I'm not sure where the administration is headed at the end of the day. What they produce will determine whether or not we can be successful. So, Senator Menendez, I think we have to end because Commissioner uh, Ross is here. With that, I want to thank you so much uh, for your comments. They are very well appreciated. And I think all of our interests in democracy and in this field are common. And thank you.